Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, dear co-chairs, Honorable Minister Niamala Sitamaran, Honorable Prime Minister Banil Vikramasinghe, ladies and gentlemen. The forum's leadership team, Sarita Naya, Murat Somnis, Olivier Schwab, and Adrian Monk, welcomes you to the 32nd India Economic Summit. And India is always an opportunity, and it's always exciting. But this year, India jumped up 16 ranks in our Global Competitiveness Report. But even more important than numbers and figures are always the people. It is the people who brought us here together and who makes the country that exciting. And so we are here today under the theme in order to drive forward India's inclusion through digital transformation. On that point, I would like to start with a welcome message from our founder and executive chairman, Professor Klaus Schwab. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear friends a very cordial, a very cordial welcome, welcome to the 32nd India, India Economic Summit. I want first to thank all our friends, and particularly the Confederation of Indian Industry, our partner, for the partnership, for the friendship, for the support for the World Economic Forum demonstrated over so many years. I would have liked to come and to join you, but unfortunately, for a personal reason, I cannot be with you. I would have liked to celebrate with you the progress made. I remember when I came first to India, there was a lot of hope and little action. Now, finally, the country is on the move. The country is attracting foreign investments. I remember when even the figure of 1 billion FDIs per year was a distant dream. Now the country, according to our competitiveness report, belongs to the 40 most competitive countries in the world. A progress of 16 places last year alone. I congratulate you. I also know that despite all this progress, despite having strengthened the institutions, despite having attracted foreign investments, despite showing a lot of entrepreneurial forces, there's still a lot to do. We will discuss the challenges of the Indian economy, but not only of the Indian economy, the challenges of South Asia during the next days. Here, two elements come particularly to my mind. The first one is the need for more inclusiveness. We see it everywhere in the world. And for this reason, the choice of the theme of this India Economic Summit is particularly appropriate. Inclusiveness in India, but in the world as such, will be one of the decisive objectives the world community, the Indian society, has to achieve. But in addition, we have to master, as we said at the beginning of the year in Davos, we have to master the fourth industrial revolution. This revolution will change not only business models, it will change the competitiveness of countries. So is countries which are forwards looking, which recognize the opportunities. So is countries which develop the necessary skills, which have the appropriate educational systems, will be the countries which succeed in the future. With our India Economic Summit, we want to make a strong contribution to recognize the issues, to recognize the opportunities, but also to work together to eliminate the risks. So thank you again for joining. 
I look for many other years of cooperation and I look particularly very much forward to my next visit, which will be soon in India. And ladies and gentlemen, this India Economic Summit could only be possible thanks to an excellent cooperation with our trusted partner, the Confederation of Indian Industry. And therefore, would like to invite the Director General of CII to welcome us on behalf of CII, the Director General Chandrajit Banerjee. Excellency, the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, Mr. Ranil Vikramasinghe, the Honorable Commerce and Industry Minister of uh, the Government of India, Mrs. Nirmala Sitaraman, my colleague and friend, Philip, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of CII, uh, welcome to this uh, annual event of the India Economic Summit, something that we have been doing. We sta started between a partnership between the CII and the World Economic Forum as you heard, for the last 30, this is the 32nd edition, and when they came into India in 1984. It's been a long partnership and a long friendship, and which is really today, which has, uh, after this long journey, over the last couple of years, we have seen growing collaboration between our two institutions on diverse areas, be it risk, be it inclusion, and, and so many other important areas that today talk about as, we, uh, as India gets this phenomenal global attention that it has got in the last two years. It's been a partnership where we have been working on areas like competitiveness, and it was so pleasing to hear that India jumping up such, uh, so strongly, those 16, 16 points, and being, as you heard, the, amongst, the 40, uh, 40, amongst the first 40 nations of global competitiveness. So in this journey, ladies and gentlemen, it's been interesting to see how the focus on India across the globe has so, uh, so well intensified in the last couple of years, and therefore we find it very, very pertinent to focus on some of the important areas that we, the, 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 and, uh, that, that we call the pillars of the summit. And the pillars of the summit, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, one, number one is on the fourth uh, industrial revolution, which is, again, very pertinent for India. We're also talking about sustainable and equitable growth, uh, which is, again, a very important pillar of our work together. And as we have worked between our institutions and within India to, again, reflect on this as an important pillar was an important area to focus on. And third, again, an, another index which, where India has fared very strongly, where we have seen a lot of work in the, um, in the last two years in the central government, in all the states of India, is on ease of doing business. And, that, and all of this together make India so very competitive and makes this uh, strong uh, bright spot that we talk in the global economy today is indeed India. And being the fastest growing emerging economy, uh, we, are, uh, we are indeed very pleased to see the uh, this collaboration resulting in, in this type of a qualitative turnout in terms of uh, in terms of speakers, in terms of global leaders, in terms of global business who, ha who are participating in this conference over the next two days, today and tomorrow. And we and, and would really like to, on behalf of CII, uh, warmly thank the co-chairs who have played such an important role in shaping this very, very uh, uh, timely conference in India, which once again renews us to think uh, our strategies and, and the way forward as we go along this very, very important journey. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for being here in such strong numbers and, sh uh, and, and, and uh, we wish you that you have uh, very good deliberations in all the sessions which have been so well crafted. And I would like to thank the entire World Economic Forum team uh, we, uh, which has been working so sincerely with us in, in putting this uh, conference together as we go along and we look forward to many more years of partnership to take this very, very important relationship further. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, as you may know, the World Economic Forum is an international institution for public-private cooperation. And after having heard the private sector, it's now my great honor, pleasure to come now to the public sector. And we are here together with the Minister of State for Trade and Commerce in independent charge, and would like now to invite the Minister of State 
here to the stage, Niamala Sitamaram. Your Excellency, the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, Mr. Chandrajit Banerjee of the CII, distinguished guests. It gives me great, great pleasure to be here this morning in your 32nd uh, session of this uh, India Summit of the World Economic Forum is happening. It's a very important event. In fact, the CIA and the WEF, the World Economic Forum, have been playing for the last 30 years a very important role in getting industry, business leaders to come and meet, to interact, and to discuss in the context of global economic dynamics as to what kind of issues are going to prevail what is the direction we're going to be taking, and the exchanged views drove into policy making. As a result, you've had this forum actually becoming a catalytic agent in creating meaningful and purposeful policy which helps the industry. Of course, every now and then, it had uh, to be tempered down by the realities of global economic situation. As we are now tempered, by the not so encouraging global environment. But of course, the 30 years of uh, role that you've played has been very well recognized. And even today, therefore, irrespective of the fact that the global indicators are not very conducive, I think this meet is going to set the agenda for looking forward to uh, certain directions which we need. And it is not to be forgotten that it is going to be South and Southeast Asia, which is going to be the engine of growth, engine of development, engine of all economic dynamics for the forthcoming future. And therefore, this meet acquires a certain significance. And I'm glad that the World Economic Forum and the CIA have focused on some very critical areas, which actually matches up with what Government of India is doing under the leadership of the Prime Minister, whose single line, um, forward is Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas. And when you're talking about inclusive growth, it's exactly that, that which, which we need to focus on. And therefore, there is definitely a synergy between the focus of this work, uh, meet as much as Government of India's approach to uh, our economic affairs. You're talking about digital uh, world and the digi digital role of digital uh, activities which will enhance economic development. If your three-pillared uh, attention is going towards mastering uh, the fourth industrial revolution, talking about uh, ease of doing business, or when you're talking about uh, equitable growth, inclusive and equ equitable growth for a sustained future, all of this sits well with what the government of India is doing. If you would only take the three examples, which are very current and pertinent to the way in which government is moving forward, you see that there is complete synergy between the agenda with which you are talking today and what government of India is doing. You take the example of GST. The GST is going to bring on one platform and have, through the digital um, uh, enablers, over 800 transactions, both goods and services, on one platform. And symbolically making India, not just symbolically, but making India a single market. If this is achieved only through the digital revolution in India, you will get the size and the scale of what we are talking about. The second is the jam, as we call it, the Jandan Yojana, Aadhaar, and the mobile based changes, the transformational changes that we're bringing in, you're talking about inclusive anyway. Jandan Yojana brought financial inclusion to those who have never had a bank account before. Aadhaar is the way in which we are moving towards direct benefit transfer to those who deserve it. And the mobile connectivity, 
not just the smartphones, any phone through which you can get basic information about the pension which is getting uh, credited to your account or about the food ration that reaches your store or about any little transaction that is happening in that little account that you've opened recently, all that is possible through your mobile. So if these two, the GST, the Jandan, uh, the JAM, the Jandan, Aadhaar, and the mobile-based transformation are both not enough, I will add the third, which is again one of, your, one of the pillars on which you're going to be talking about, the ease of doing business, on which using technology, opening up newer areas of activity, we are making states come on board with the center to make sure the state and the center together remove all the hurdles to making business do their activity in great comfort. The process is long wound, but certainly it has commenced. The ranking, therefore, between the states has become a healthy competition, similar to the global ranking uh, which India normally looks forward to. We want to improve our position each year. And uh, therefore, what you're trying to achieve through this uh, meet is exactly what the government of India is doing through the digital revolution that we are trying to bring in, using technology to bring in transparency, remove corruption totally, so that ease of doing business also is facilitated and enabled. Without saying more, I wish the meet all success. I look forward to seeing the outcome of uh, the deliberations of today. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my honor and pleasure to invite here to the stage the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka, Honorable Ranil Vikramasinghe. Honorable Minister, Philip, distinguished guests and friends. I must thank you for having invited me here today to take part in the World Economic Forum. They told me I have three minutes, stick to the three minutes, so I brought, I put on my politician's watch, but the, because at three minutes there will be a big signal, it will go off. The World Economic Forum in Delhi this year it says the world is expecting India to translate its potential into ac action. That we are at the threshold of another historic moment. If, it, if the pace of reform fails to pick up, companies may look elsewhere. Where is elsewhere? It has to be India or China. That's the hard truth. There are no other place to go today. The rules were written by the West, globalization. And the empire, we have only played by it. You encourage, or most of these people, you also went and uh, deposited part of their funds and their assets in uh, the Western country. No one complained. When their own people started going to Switzerland, they started complaining. You know, everyone has to take the assets out and take it back home. That's one way. When it affects them only. If, it, if we came and banked there, all and good. But if we don't get revenue because our revenue is also going into those uh, tax havens, then it is all bad. I was reading, they were commending India for ease of doing business. But yesterday I read Theresa May. Every factory must put down all their employees there and how many are foreign and how many are not. What will happen to India if you do that? Okay, we will bail out. Asia will bail the world out if we are allowed to write the rules. <laughs> Otherwise, we create our own system here. We'll do it, I mean. It'll be a very, very stable system. 
Not like in America, one day you find the Deutsche Bank 14 billion, and next day you say you can go off with four or five billion. So uh, let me say a few words of what we in Sri Lanka want to do, together with India and the other Asian countries. Recently, the IMF revised downward these figures for global growth. However, South Asia sustained itself as the fastest growing region in India as the engine of growth. China, which is rebalancing its economy, is also maintaining an acceptable level of growth. The better performing Asian economies provide Sri Lanka with space to carry out our major reforms. These are a macroeconomic stabilization, which is based on fiscal consolidation, increase of tax revenue, which will reduce our budget deficit to 3.5% by 2020 with a primary surplus of 1%. And this stabilization program will be accompanied by measures to restructure the economy, which includes exchange rate flexibility and trade liberalization to make Sri Lanka a platform for value addition. We are also liberalizing the tariff and the non-tariff barriers that have denied our enterprises the opportunity of getting access to the latest technology and know-how and deprived our consumers of the best quality of goods and services. We are also taking measures to see a rapid improvement of the ease of doing business by the early part of 2018. Maximizing on these factors will transform Sri Lanka into a geoeconomic center of South Asia, dynamically and synergically engaged with the rest of the region. A key thrust is our trade policy. Small domestic markets are insufficient to sustain growth. Therefore, shift to greater export orientation is required to achieve a growth of 8%. Hence, our trade policies will focus on gaining access to these markets. The tripartite arrangement. We are cognizant that the economic asymmetry between Sri Lanka and India is going to increase in the future when the latter emerges as a major global player in an increasingly multipolar world. The India-Sri Lanka FTA between the two countries will be further expanded and deepened to go beyond trading goods to cover trade in services, investments and technology cooperation. The proposed economic and technology cooperation agreement will be signed by the end of this year. The both ministers who are working it are present uh, in this room today, and Prime Minister Modi and I decided we must conclude it by end of this year. The ETCA offers a strategic economic advantage to our country and the fastest growing South, southern Indian states. These five southern states, Kandaka, Andhra, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, and Telangana, Telangana have a population of 250 million people and a combined GDP of nearly US 450 billion, with the addition of Sri Lanka's 22 million and a US 80 billion economy. The GDP in this sub region will be US 500 billion. That is Sweden. This is without getting together. Just imagine if we work together. So that's where your growth will come, madam. You, I, both of us are from the same region. Ah. ECTA has the potential to promote a rapid growth of US 500 billion sub-regional economy. And that's where you come in. You have to put the infrastructure in, put up the buildings, supply the cement, so many things. We are also negotiating a free trade agreement with Singapore. There's already a comprehensive economic partnership agreement, SIPA, between Singapore and India. Therefore, we believe that by next year, Singapore, India, SIPA, Indo Lanka, ECTA, and the Sri Lanka, Singapore, FTA will enable the southern sub region of South Asia and Singapore to establish a tripartite arrangement for trade and investment. Now, it's not only both, both of us and our, our southern states and Sri Lanka. Uh, we always wonder who has the better crab curry, Kerala loss. Uh, but you bring Singapore in. And then why not, as I've told, uh, speaking to the Prime Minister, why not Indonesia? Why not, that's, why not uh, Malaysia and the other remaining BIMSTEC countries? So let's have a whole area 
around the Bay of Bengal, place of economic uh, cooperation and a vibrant market. I mean, that's what we envisage and that's what we should work for. The growth is here. At the end of the day, it's not neoliberalism or free marketerism or anything else that worked. It was that in our areas, people just multiplied. We gave the basic services, and now there's sufficient income in hand for the takeoff. So let's, let's uh, look at it. One Belt, One Road. A free trade agreement with China under One Belt, One Road initiative is being negotiated. This is necessary for us to make a success of the Chinese investments that has come into the Hambantote AC hub, which will also be inter industrialized with industrial parks, and uh, the proposed financial city, which is on a renegotiated agreement for the port city. There has been a lot of uh, suspicion as to a military element in it. There are no military element, and I, I can't. We are told that very, very clear to the Chinese. Chinese have agreed. But what from I discussed with them, it's going to be a, their own uh, mode of economic diplomacy pushing all the way to uh, Europe. At a, at a time like this, we might as well utilize the initiative also, and it's a, this will be a meeting point. Sri Lanka's long-standing eco economic cooperation in Japan will help us further to modernize the economy. We are now discussing on a much closer agreement with uh, Japan, and uh, while they are talking with us, the Japanese are also talking with the, uh, Delhi, and also Singaporeans are talking with Delhi and with us. So you can see while there are all bilateral agreements, there will be synergy in these agreements. So th here you are getting a big economic area for business. We have the major people are coming in. The Minister for Development Strategy went into South Korea. I'll be traveling there that they would also like to join in. So this is where the action is. Don't go anywhere else. Be around in the region. And when you are tired, you can come to Sri Lanka for a holiday. We have got some good boutique hotels. <laughs> And the Japanese are working on a candy mega development project to a city of 1.5 million people, the science and technology project. The Singaporeans, Japanese, and uh, Indians are working on the Trinco economic development project. We have already made application to the European Union, regain the GSP plus facility for tariff relief. This facility will give Sri Lanka a competitive edge in accessing the single European market. So our uh, idea is that we will, be ac we will have access to the Chinese market, Indian market, Singaporean market, and the European market in the first round. The, we will have to negotiate separately with uh, UK, who has taken 40% of our exports to the single market. and. Uh, we are also planning to uh, negotiate with USA after the presidential election. And in preparation for it, we have also set aside about 500 acres for a golf course and a Trump building. <laughs> <laughs> the key sectors which we are looking at immediately are the manufacturing services, which includes, I mean, I don't know if this is appropriate when you look at the fourth industrial revolution, digitalized, digital economy, all this gets into it. And we are seriously thinking of robotics. Well, I think Sri Lanka's rapid gain in population will not be that rapid. It's going to be in other South Asian countries, Indonesia, Myanmar, not in Sri Lanka. And we may have to go looking at the aspirations of our people to go in for uh, robotics. Logistics, finance, and business, because we want to become logistics hub. Finance, business, tourism, which is the low-hanging fruit that we are working on. But there are other areas also, and we will be opening it out. In the physical infrastructure, poor physical infrastructure is one of the problems of South Asia. And uh, we want, to, if we are to exploit our geostrategic position, the government, headed by President Maitripala Sirisena, has decided to build on uh, 
certain areas to enable Sri Lanka to become the logistic, finance, and business hub of the Indian Ocean. And uh, we have already planning out this program of physical infrastructure development to overhaul the sea, air, road transportation, energy sector, and telecommunications so as to form the backbone of the hub. I, let me explain to you the two major development corridors. The Candy Colombo Hambantota Corridor, that will reshape country's urban landscape with two airports, two seaports. This corridor will amalgamate three, five separate projects. The Candy Mega De Development Project, which is the Japanese have undertaken to plan. The Wyamba, the Northwestern Industrial and Tourism Development Project, that will take the spillover of industries and tourism in the western area. The US 40 billion Western Megapolis project aims to develop the Western province as a megapolis with metropolitan areas on a global scale. The Colombo port will be modernized with up-to-date infrastructure to accommodate triple E-class megaships. The Katunayaka International Airport will be further expanded. It will include a logistics corridor, industrial cluster, a science and technology city. The proposed financial city built on 269 hectares from the sea will fill the vacuum for financial service hub along the trading route between the cities of Singapore and Dubai. The financial city will function as a special jurisdiction area with its own economic and commercial laws based on the English law. We'll just apply the English law in total. To facilitate operations of global multinational corporations and grow as a business and financial hub. Finally, the Southern Tourist and Industrial Project, and last of all, the US dollar 10 billion Hambantota Area Hub Economic Development Project, which invites investment to build oil refineries, power generation plants, and industrial zones. The second is the Rajarata Corridor on the eastern side. The Sri Lanka government has entered into agreement with Subana Jurong Private Limited to prepare the master plan for Trincomalee, based on shipping, manufacturing, and tourism. The Trincomalee port is envisaged as a major transshipment port for the Bay of Bengal trade. We are also holding discussions with India and Japan in regard to this project. An area of 176 kilometers to the south of Trincomalee will also be developed as a high-end tourist resort. Then other area to the north of Trincomalee too. We haven't left that out. The North Central Province Development Program with two large reservoirs that have been built the Moragahakanda Reservoir and the Malvatuaya Reservoir for irrigation for agriculture. Three, rebuilding both the economy and the social life in the northern province. And finally, modernizing agriculture and fisheries in this mainly rural economy of the Rajarat Corridor. To achieve this human capital, the last of all, to achieve this ambitious program, Sri Lanka aims to make vast strides in improving the quality of our human capital, our most invaluable resource. Over the next decade, an example of how talented our people are can be seen in the significant overrepresentation of Sri Lankan managers in specialized ready-made industry garment sectors across Bangladesh and parts of India. So our program includes a 13 years of compulsory education. Every child will have to receive a compulsory education, maybe academic, maybe vocational. A promotion of preschools and daycare centers. That also means higher participation of women in the labor force. Modern vocational and technical education tied to the job market. See, promoting English learning and IT. And finally, promoting innovation and the establishment of tech, our technology, uh, technology institute for higher education and research. What is our final aim? Our final aim is a very highly competitive social market economy, not a socialist market economy. It's a market economy in which uh, the benefits are shared e e equitably by the people. We will see, finally, we have already had a program of financial inclusion, uh, passed a new law on microcredit, and a new act, and a new program to promote small and medium enterprises. Find the jobs will come from the small and medium enterprises and microcredit, as some of the industries go towards automation. This is where the job creation and the income comes. <clears throat> we will uh, 
aim for a highly inclusive, fair, uh, high inclusion, and fair and equal opportunity, and broad-based ownership. We are already wasting the lands given to farmers by the government, over a million people, with a freehold title. These are bankable documents. Houses which they occupied for generations, give them the ownership. We, our final aim is to create jobs, uh, increase income, expand the middle class, and stabilize our rural economy. If you have done that, then our people will be happy. That's the formula that everyone wants, whether it's been in India, China, Korea, Japan, or down into Thailand. I think we can deliver, and we can make it on our own, and we can build our own markets. But then, as I said earlier, we must also be allowed to share in writing the rules. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Prime Minister. And now it's my honor and pleasure to invite our respected co-chairs, as well as our today's session moderator, here to us on stage for our opening panel discussion. Please. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, opening plenary. Uh, just a quick housekeeping announcement. The next sessions will start at 10.30 uh, on, on schedule. We'll, we'll try and wrap this up uh, to give you enough time to go to any other uh, rooms or halls that you may have to go to. I'd like to uh, thank all the co-chairs for being with us in this opening plenary, and also Nirmala Sitharaman, whom I'm actually going to get to start off and just tell us what it is that India is actually doing to continue to transform the potential that we've been speaking about into actual action. And yes, there are things in the last couple of years to be, to be quite proud of. The growth rate continues to be buoyant, continues to grow. Um, and now India is the fastest growing economy uh, in the world, well ahead of China. So I'm going to ask each of you, if I may, the, all the co-chairs to spend maybe two or three minutes in just outlining for us the progress that you think has been made to transform India's potential into reality and perhaps also give us your one or two ideas of what you think the urgent priority should be uh, going forward. And I think that will, that will shed a lot of light here. Um, I just want to introduce, uh, not that most of you need any introduction, but I quickly will introduce the entire panel out here. Nirmala Sitaraman, of course, is the Minister of State for Commerce and Industry in India. Uh, John Rice is the Vice Chairman of GE uh, at uh, Hong Kong SAR. Anil Agarwal, Executive Chairman Vedanta Resources. Uh, thanks a lot for being with us. Vidya Shekhar Sharma is uh, Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Paytm, Amitabh Kant, Chief Executive Officer Nithi Ayog. Uh, Johan Orik is the Global Managing Partner and Chairman of the Board at AT Kani. And Kita Gopinath is Professor of Economics at Harvard University and, of course, a young global leader. Thank you all for being with us. Uh, Nirmala Sitharaman, if I could just turn that, that question to you. So, yes, a certain number of positive steps have been taken, GST in particular. But I'm sure there are specific items on your agenda for the next five or six months or one year so that India continues to go up the competitiveness ladder. We've broken into the top 40, which is a matter of some pride, but I'm sure you won't be content with that. Absolutely not. We need to work harder. We need to um, take the states on board. I'm happy to say they're working together with us. Um, there is definitely a lot of uh, regulatory mechanisms which go down to the level of the local bodies, the municipalities, uh, the panchayats, all of which will have to be eased out. 
And uh, therefore, our next four, five months will definitely, as was in the last one year, um, our attention would be to work together with them, take out all those which are obstructionist, and ensure that businesses feel far more assured that uh, uh, the ease is actually coming in, in uh, their activity. Also, to, um, I'm happy to say that uh, the FDI flow is really very good. But we also have to translate that into meaningful investments and rapidly get them on to uh, translate into job creation, uh, output creation, and so on. So they can't just be investments coming in, but rapidly also move on to the phase where the production takes place. Uh, exports happen from them. They're not going to be producing just for India, but they're also going to be producing to export from India. So these are things on which we are working. There is a, a, a slight gap between India's position in the competitiveness index and the ease of doing business index. In, I mean, in competitiveness, India's top 40, but not in the ease of doing business. And that clearly is a direction, along with better infrastructure, that clearly signals the direction in which we need to move as a country. Yes, absolutely. And uh, also, uh, you raised the point of uh, infrastructure. Uh, that affects our competitiveness, no doubt. But it's also a question of uh, effectively converting all that is produced in India, particularly in the rural areas, particularly th uh, tier three uh, uh, towns, so that better market access is provided. The uh, back-end facilities will have to be created. So there is a comprehensive agenda of work which is pending, which is ongoing, but more to achieve. So there are going to be interministerial um, work uh, assessment and also ensuring that work moves fast. Uh, the interministerials will also be happening uh, just to ensure that this goal is achieved. Right. Um, John Rice, if I could turn to you next. What, to your mind, is it that India needs to do next? And um, in particular, if you could also touch on the theme of, of infrastructure, which is uh, an area I'm sure you've been, you've been studying in great uh, sure. depth. Well, thank you for that. Um, you know, the mission, as the minister has described uh, and others, is sustainable, inclusive growth. Uh, there's a lot of things that factor into that. You've got to create a million jobs a month. And you want to keep those jobs. So you ha the, the, that puts a priority on, on skill building, creating the right skills to do the jobs well. Uh, it puts a priority on productivity, because you won't keep those jobs if you don't engage in productive activities. So productivity has to continue to improve. And I would offer a, a simple suggestion, too. We're a big proponent and participant in Make India. We have been from the beginning. Uh, we've announced significant investments in Bihar and Pune, and, and we love what we're doing here. I think more of an e emphasis should be put on exports, because the true benchmark for what you're building in any location around the world is your ability to compete on a global scale. So if you're not exporting, you're, you might not be competitive. We're happy that we, we export 50% of what we manufacture in India, but maybe that should be higher. And I think just as a side note, uh, the, the country ought to think about an export credit agency. There are some 60 countries around the world that support manufacturing exports with active export credit agencies, and I think India should be one of those. Right. I'm wondering whether I can quickly ask you whether you think that's a good idea or something that you're thinking of. Which particular? The, the producing for part. export. The export credit part. Uh, well, yes, it can always be thought about, but there are several aspects to it which okay. will have to be uh, attuned to India. All right. I I thought I'd try my luck by getting a snap answer to that. But, but yes, it's, it's certainly worth something worth considering. Uh, Anil Agarwal, um, you know, one of, India has obviously had a great success in creating global companies, not always from within India. If you look at the number of global companies that are headed or CEO'd or chaired by, by Indians, is actually quite, quite staggering. Uh, what are the impediments in building out those global companies right here in this country? No, it, it is a... Uh, Phenomenal time we have uh, in Vedanta, we have raised uh, last 10 years $30 billion abroad, 2 lakh crore, and invested all the money 
most of the money into India, and we have find that the how the uh, this this uh, uh, this regime, this government, uh, 1.3 billion people, tremendous opportunity, tremendous opportunity. I never, I never felt uh, in last two decades this kind of buzz. What, what is happening about India in the world, which I have seen and I'm I'm feeling it. It's very important that we we develop our SMEs. SMEs are the need of our. Is a startup is SMEs. Um, and uh, I'm in the sector of natural resource. It's amazing what India import $400 billion worth of natural resources, which is oil and gas, whether it's talk about uh, gold, whether it's talk about copper, anything. And it's a tremendous availability. And uh, being a digital uh, era is a great opportunity to assess what reserves are there, and it is assessed to make sure that uh, we can develop these in the most sustainable manner. You know, I'll just give you a small example. Uh, the, uh, the world best diamond, the Kohinoor, has come from India. The best marble, which the made by uh, Taj Mahal, has come from India, the Victoria Terminus. The gold, which has been produced, the first gold was produced, was in India. And if you see the oil production, one of the first production of oil was produced in Assam. So it's very important that we, uh, the government has coming out with the policies, and uh, to look at the natural resource is a great time. So we uh, to eradicate poverty, and if you look at the West, uh, whether you look at the America, Canada, they have all talk about the natural resource, and it's a very important time for us to eradicating poverty, um, and most digital manner, more most uh, 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 the technology is tremendous today. Uh, you don't have to do as much as work what we used to do earlier. We can be more accurate. So it's a great opportunity, great time for India. Right. Uh, Vijay Shekhar Sharma, I mean, if you look at the topic uh, specifically, it, it actually says how can India transform the state of its economy and people through digital transformation. And digital India is obviously a big theme of, of the government as well. Um, you clearly one of the people who believe in that. And do you think that the digital economy and the startup economy, which you exemplify perhaps better than anyone else whom I can think of, is that really the path that India should take? The old economy stuff is all very well and it's great, but if India is really going to transform, it will be by taking leadership in the digital world. I fundamentally believe that uh, digital economy offers unparalleled opportunity to India because we've traditionally been building software for the Western countries or developed countries. And this is for the first time that India itself is consuming significant amount of technology produce, which is in the form of mobile apps and financial inclusion and retail commerce and sorts of services. And I think for the first time what we're seeing is that Indians are very proud for producing for India. Otherwise, we used to have a brain drain. Most of the time you will get out of an engineering college and the best thing that you should do probably for your career used to be called go USA or go in a other country and work there. And that is why we have great number of CEOs and chairmen like we talked about in the world. But now it is sort of considered as a level two or a level three option. The first option is always about opening a startup with the kind of push that Indian government is pushing on startup in the India agenda or working for a technology which is going to serve the Indians. I'm very proud that Indian entrepreneurs are not trying to replicate what has been built but accepting that we have to build something for India. And Something for India that we will build will generate larger dividends for entrepreneurs in this country because we will have a much larger audience left from the Western company servicing audience. Uh, if you see Facebook, Google, or all sorts of Western countries, companies, they have more or less served the first billion audience, these people who are sort of rich and have an access to a desktop computer. Their primary technologies have been served on computers which used to have internet connection. And for companies like us, we know that the consumers of our will have a smartphone. So our magic is smartphone, and that is where Indians are building it. And with the kind of support that startups get, it is incredible. And I'm, I'm totally thrilled. I've been a startup person for the last 15 years. In a way, I'll wishfully remain forever in my life. And I can say that no other government ever thought of these young companies to be thought about and talked about like we have in this country at this government stage. And uh, I, I wish that all of us Indian entrepreneurs 
prove to the world that India will not be the third world when it comes to the technology and it will be the first world and lead the way forward for the world to see it from and learn from India. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that's, that's one of the definite ways of going forward and who better to get uh, to elaborate on that than Amitabh Kant, who's uh, one of the people who's been very closely involved with the entire theme of, of Startup India, along with Make in India, of course. Amitabh, startups in particular, uh, India is already, has become one of the major startup hubs in the world. Uh, and that's not necessarily something that should surprise us because Indians are among the most entrepreneurial of people. They may not be the most organized of people, but they are certainly the most entrepreneurial of, of people. Um, and of course, if you look at startup hubs elsewhere in the world, notably Silicon Valley, it's largely been driven by Indians. There's a very disproportionate share of Indians there. So what Vijay was saying that this is really the path, uh, unleash the entrepreneurial instincts of the Indian people and allow the startup wave to take India forward. Is that something you believe in? No, I greatly believe in it because the only way India can catch up with the rest of the world and grow at rates of 9 to 10 percent per annum is if we use technology to leapfrog. Uh, the challenge for India is really to become the most, uh, you know, if you have a billion biometrics and if you're going to buy 2024, if you're going to have a billion uh, smartphones, uh, you need to become the most disruptionist nation in the world. You know, the West has always innovated, but India needs to innovate for uh, the next one billion population of India, but also for the seven billion population. And India needs to innovate in urbanization. It needs to innovate for sewage. It needs to innovate for clean water. It doesn't need to innovate for driverless car, but it needs to innovate for Indian and the rest of the people. And therefore, my view is that the process of... Uh, uh, technology needs to embed our process of urbanization, which will be one of the biggest challenges which India will face. If by 2050, 700 million people are going to get into the process of urbanization, India will have to do very innovative and very sustainable urbanization, all on the back of good technology. Right, so if you're looking at just to prioritize that, so startups will happen, urbanization will happen, and use disruptive technologies, you're saying, in everything that is happening across the board, not just in the startup era. Uh, well, startups will cut across, you know, they'll disrupt the world not merely of digital technology, but they'll disrupt health, they'll disrupt education, they'll disrupt the process of embedding urbanization, they'll uh, do a lot of more social innovation across sector, and that's happening actually. So Indian startups are bringing the kind of energy and vibrancy which has rarely been seen before. Right, it's a very good way of looking at it. It's just, sometimes people think startups are only in the digital area, but actually they, they do cut across. John Roderick, if I can just get you in. Um, I think it was a year ago, perhaps right here at the World Economic Forum, that you had expressed the views that perception of India was still to change dramatically you know, elsewhere in, in the world, and there was still a certain amount of skepticism elsewhere. In the year that's passed since then, has that perception changed, uh, or is it still, there's still a certain amount of skepticism that the India story is often being talked up, but sometimes not, the promise is not always delivered? Um, thank you, uh, Vikram. Um, I, I really think there is, in short, every reason to be very bullish and optimistic uh, about India. The promise, uh, I suppose, was always there. Um, yeah. But what has changed over the last years is that particularly the government has become a facilitator and a driver of change, and it should be recognized, perhaps to the surprise of many skeptics and cynics around the world. Um, and I really would like to pay, uh, pay homage uh, to that. Uh, that. That really has taken place. Uh, you mentioned the competitive index uh, jump that was made. Um, foreign direct investment uh, was, was made last year. I believe 62 billion uh, was invested by foreign, uh, foreign uh, investors in India. Um, every year, AT Carney, my company, publishes the FDI index, which is a forward-looking index. So where. Uh, investors anticipate to invest uh, money in. And there, uh, India for the first time jumped into the global top 10. So uh, we very much expect this FDI flow to, uh, to continue. Um, we should also, however, recognize that there's still, uh, and we all know that, um, uh, many challenges uh, remain ahead. Um, uh, we are very fortunate to work with the World Economic Forum and many, uh, many partners on a, a multi-year project uh, to look at the future of production of manufacturing. And obviously, Make in India comes, uh, comes to mind uh, there. Um, the work is still ongoing, um, but what is already becoming clear uh, is that uh, the Make in India program, uh, which is a very ambitious program to, um, uh, to deliver up to 100 million jobs 
uh, by the year 2022. Uh, and already good progress has been made. The challenges uh, will, however, be daunting there. You mentioned the forced, fourth industrial revolution, all the digital developments. Well, there's a healthy tension uh, between jobs and digital developments, and we all are beginning to understand that. And uh, we really hope that this conference, the next two days, will be able to talk about that, how we can overcome them, uh, how we can make it positive, how we can make sure that progress is inclusive uh, and, uh, um, and, um, um, and have a very good discussion on that. So we're looking forward to about that. All right, uh, Gita, let me get some final thoughts from you before I come back to the panel with actual steps that need to be taken. Your take on where India is positioned right now? Uh, India is in a very, uh, very strong position. Uh, it's been touted as uh, one of the markets to go to with the source of uh, growth in the world economy. So it really has a, a very good standing. Uh, the question to look for, forward, and I hope this uh, summit delivers on that, is how is it that India can sustain this growth over many decades, not over the next five years, but you know, across political cycles, across elections, manages to sustain this. Because we've had many episodes of countries that have had spurts of growth, things look great and promising, but then you, know, you have a lost decade at the end of it. So if you look at countries in Europe, if you look at Greece, at one point Greece looked like the destination to go to, and it's pretty much undone most of the growth it's had uh, over the last 10 years. And so, I would really hope, and this is the biggest challenge for any country in the world, is to have sustainable growth. I mean, it doesn't have to be dramatic. It could just be 8%, but 8% growth for a, few dec for a couple of decades would be absolutely fantastic. To do that, you would require to continue doing these reforms. You'd have to continuously see improvements, the ease of doing business, in the competitiveness. The social institutions, the political institutions, the economic institutions have to keep pace with it. Uh, and if that's done, and if the world notices that this is actually happening in a sustainable way, then that will be absolutely mind-blowing for India. Well, 8% growth is reasonably dramatic, especially if it's carried on over a couple of decades. Yes, but that's exactly what we should, we should be talking about. I mean, we're in a session called the inflection point. I think if, that, if there is an inflection point, it will be if right. India can stay at numbers like that for a long period of time. And I think, uh, before I turn to the audience, I, I think I actually completely agree with you that that is really the challenge, to make sure that whatever is happening, it's not a spurt, because country after country around the world has spurted and then it falls away. If you really want transformation, what China and some of the others were able to do, Korea, is have that growth for a prolonged period of time, and that's when you really get transformation. So, Nirmachi, if I can come back to you, maybe I want to get all the other co-chairs to also, one thought of something that, that you think uh, should be on the agenda to achieve exactly what Gita was saying. Make sure that whatever is happening is for, all, for, it's for a long period of time, it's sustainable, and it's not something that's going to go away. What would your thought be on that? I would think that is achievable, given the um, commitment with which this government is working. And uh, across states, we find that urge now that they want to get out of the rigmarole and uh, um, see brighter days. And therefore, I think if this sense prevails, prevails across states, and above all, they find now uh, the kind of issues on which we have to come together and get over the difficulties are actually helping politics. If only you succeed in uh, removing these obstructions, and if you're committed to moving forward on using technology, making sure transparent processes are established, these are being very well received even by the Am Janta, the common people. And if that's going to be a vote-winning proposition, therefore, if the people are able to receive it as a good idea, and it makes a difference to their lives, I can see that uh, the 8% growth argument moving not just with one particular government, but with every government which is ruling in the states and also future governments in Delhi. So it is ach achievable. Now the happy mo moment is that people have recognized that the factors on which we have to work are actually giving political dividends. And that's where I think political parties cannot be different from one another. Right, that's, a, that's an interesting point. And when good economics becomes good politics, that's when you are guaranteed continuity across political cycles, which is what she was talking about. 
um, out of course, and just saying that just keep on voting back, voting us back, and that's one other Obviously. way of doing it. Obviously. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That, that's the other way of doing it. All right. Um, quickly, uh, if I could just ask you, John, any one suggestion that you think you would make to say whatever is being seen is, can be made sustainable? And do you think it is sustainable in India? Well, I think it is sustainable, but you, you have to think about what's required for the 21st century and a new set of skills. I mean, we talk about the fourth industrial revolution. That we, thought, we, thought, we think about this convergence between digital and industrial. The way you lead in the 21st century is different. The way you run a manufacturing facility, the way you run a startup, you have a different set of skills that's required to win in this century. And are we collectively, it's a government responsibility, it's a company responsibility, are we investing in the right training and capacity building to deliver on an economy that we want to grow 8% a year for 20 years? All right, make sure you're investing in the right things, by which I, I guess you would include skills, education, Perhaps healthcare, and in addition yeah, to yeah, and basic infrastructure. You can't do you can't do it if if you have 200 million people without electricity. Right. Eight percent growth for 20 years is really hard to achieve, right? Fair enough. And another one: make sure that the basics are delivered. That's the, that's the first thing. Invest in the right things, including basic infrastructure. What would be the one item on your agenda? Uh, I'm again coming to the same point: is the SMEs. We consume 10, uh, we manufacture or consume 10% what, with a similar uh, population, 10% of what China does. You can see the amount and the scale what will come to India, whether you talk about aluminum. I'm just taking a small example of aluminum. You know, aluminum is startup. Uh, 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 this, the technology, the way it is coming. Today, the uh, automobile car use 600 kilos of aluminum. And that's require at least 10 different type of uh, development of components. And that's require a SMEs to come in. And that will bring tremendous job opportunity for India. So India is to find India, to produce India, make in India. That's what I believe. All right. Vijay? Quickly, any one fine point that you would yeah. like to um, I, I'll give a metaphor quickly that, uh, and I fundamentally believe that for next five years, India's opportunity is mobile internet. And uh, just remember that when it used to be telecom networks, Europeans built it, the Nokias and the Siemens of the world. And when it came to the devices that networks were using, then more or less North America took it from BlackBerry to the Apple on Android. And now comes the era of apps and services on top of these networks. and. This is the space that is meant for India because we have created software for the world. We've, we've learned the art and science of how to build world-class software. And this is what is our opportunity. Now, with the programs like Startup India, I do know that there is an attention to it. But at the same point in time, you should remember that we're talking about Indian consumers. So attention to the broadband. And I understand that basic infrastructure has been a more requirement. But I would not shy away from saying, how about putting into the internet into the basic infrastructure? The fourth industrial revolution that we talk about is requirement that there is an internet there in everybody's hand. So roti, kapla, makan, and internet, maybe that is the how we have to change in the 21st century our expectations from the government, not just roti, kapla, or makan elements there. And remember, once you do that, then startups can create a ton of jobs also here. And I think the opportunity of creating jobs from SMEs to opportunity to create jobs from building these technologies, uh, see, see the taxi sharing services. Our Indian company, Ola, has been able to get jobs and create so many people who were otherwise not having job by offering them incentives and coming on the network of ride sharing. So elements like these, uh, I, I think okay. technology has an opportunity to create jobs which we need more technology enablement as a part of government's core play. All right, Amitabh, one quick word from you and then I'm going to turn to the audience because we are already uh, running You over. want to grow at 8% on a sustained basis for three decades. You need a radical restructuring of your education and health uh, system. Uh, you need to bring the same energy into your health and education as we brought into our startup movement. Without that, it'll be impossible to grow. Sustained basis, three decades, a completely new education system is required. All right. 
John, anything you want to add which hasn't been mentioned already? <laughs> I think a lot of people, a lot of things have been mentioned already. I would like to reiterate the tension that there is between technological progress, the fourth industrial revolution, and India is already and has to do much more of that. There simply is no choice. And the creation of jobs. And as a democracy, that's the obligation of India to do that. There's a healthy tension between uh, the two. And I really hope that the next two, uh, two days will uh, shed some light on that. All right, with automation, perhaps uh, jobs becomes, a, becomes an issue. If, if too many jobs are taken away by newer technologies and that becomes puts a, its own challenge. Uh, uh, indeed. And I just want to emphasize something that was raised earlier, which is, for me, the number one priority is skilling. And okay. the reason I say that is because the returns to skilling have gone up so much. Uh, the big source of, one of the big sources of increase in inequality in the world is because of the much higher returns to skilling. And so India needs to tap into that. And unfortunately, though we've had skilling programs that have been set up over the last few years, the outcomes are not desirable. All right, um, I think we are, we are over time uh, a little bit, but I'm gonna try and get just one or maybe two comments. So the gentleman here in the second row, yeah. Yeah, just speak. Yeah. Oh, there, Mike is coming to you. As we bring efficiency to industry, or to agriculture, or to our social sector. By necessity, it will result in job eliminations. Some jobs are lost when efficiencies come. So okay. there will be a transition period when we will see jobless growth, So, which has been the case for a while, when we, India has registered growth, but at the same time, jobs have not grown. And two have to be managed together optimally as we go through restructuring. So okay. while skilling is an enabler, skilling will not create jobs. So what should be the strategy of the country that we find jobs for which skilling is an enabler? We will need to do that. All right, let's hope the forum over the next couple of days finds the answer to that particular question. Last comment, and then I have to wrap the session. The gentleman there. If you can just get him a mic. Last, last row there, yeah. Yeah, if you can just pass the mic to him. Right. Hi, I'm J.D. Bansal. I'm a global shaper from Chandigarh. And uh, I'm involved in the electrification of the remotest villages of India in the Himalayas. Villages don't, that don't even have access to basic lighting. My question to you, ma'am, is what, we are in a way doing the government's work of reaching out to these marginalized communities and setting up DC microgrids. How can the government help initiatives like mine we have been, frankly, working, uh, I mean, thankful to the World Economic Forum that I've, we've been able to work with corporates to raise funds for the electrification of these villages. But right. how can we work with the government on such initiatives? And this is for my peers as well who are working on such initiatives which are essentially doing what the government can, uh, uh, supporting the government in the work that they do. You want to that? Well, first of all, uh, congratulations for the work that you're doing. And uh, it's a, a classic example of how private participation together with the government can expedite things. But however, um, on electrification and on many other such um, activities, today the government is open-minded about co-opting private participation, um, whether it is work participation or capital participation. So um, you are at the best of times for working together with the government. So irrespective of the field, in your case, electricity and extension of electricity to the rural areas, far-flung areas, um, definitely opportunity exists. Government is open about working together. You should only contact the respective departments. You can always work it out for yourself. All right, Mr. Sitharaman, thank you so much for that. And I'd like to thank all the co-chairs for having been with us uh, as well. And let's hope some of the points that were thrown up and some of the questions that still remain, we will actually get answers uh, during the World Economic Forum's India Economic Summit. Thank you all so much for having joined us. Just a quick reminder that the next sessions will start at 10.30. So uh, that's not going to shift. So do, do join us at the next session at 10.30. Thank, Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Nice. Nice.